Okay. Uh, okay, today I'm going to do something a bit different. Uh, I've been playing around with documentation and using LaTeX for said documentation, uh, and I'm still I'm still investigating the ins and outs of doing that. Uh, the long and the short of it is I'm now considering uh, a pipeline, uh, starting with some markdown and data sources from uh, a semantic wiki but also uh, as my sort of primary uh, document generation system i'm going to use latex for some books uh, various support material for the courses uh, but also for articles to be posted online so i've got this idea that uh, it will start out as a LaTeX document, be produced to an intermediate form of HTML with uh, metadata block at the beginning. Uh, and similarly, uh, the markdown and output from a database could also go to this HTML slash metadata format and then take all of that uh, in fact, the meta, in fact, the, the markdown can just be produced as markdown, and then all of that gets fed through uh, a Jekyll uh, static site builder to produce the final target website uh, or websites. Um, and of course, all of that can be arranged into uh, a continuous integration pipeline. Uh, so yeah, so that's the thing at the moment. But anyway, we'll we'll, we'll come back to that at some point in the future once I've ironed out a few wrinkles and, and done some research. In the meantime, I thought it'd be interesting to look at uh, networking in preparation for the next stage of the main DevOps thread, which is setting up firewalls. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to set up firewall. Um, for each of the hosts on our system. Uh, in actual fact, there are going to be two types of firewall. I mean, basically, a firewall is a firewall in this instance, but but, but we're going to do two types. Uh, on the main server, we're just going to have a host firewall, uh, and all it's going to do is protect uh, the server one uh, from the rest of the network, and indeed the rest of the network from server one. As we'll see, it's a two-way process. Uh, server 2, uh, if you recall, is going to be our router uh, slash uh, gateway router uh, to the internet. So the firewall there is to protect our uh, our LAN, the entire network on the inside, from the rest of the world. That's not entirely true, as we'll see when we come to do it, but in essence, that's what we're going to try and do. Now, to understand the way uh, our firewall works, uh, we first need to understand a little bit about the way networks work. Now, <laughs> uh, this is going to make any of you that are network specialists cry, uh, because I I'm not going to try to be 100% accurate. Um, what I want to do is get across the, the concepts and just do some illustration of the, of the way this all fits together. So we'll start uh, by thinking about networks in general. Uh, and, and talking about, uh, okay, okay, let, let's, let's think about a, a, a network. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's talk about a network. Um, right. Let's say I have uh, four machines. Okay, it doesn't matter what they are. Machine one, machine two, machine three, and machine four. Uh, and just because we're going to be using numbers later, let's call them actually call them A, B, C, and D. Now I could wire these together in all all sorts of ways. Um, most commonly we show it like this okay which is not actually very accurate for what we're going to be doing but it'll do for now but the idea is that if machine a wants to talk to machine 
D. Okay, it's going to make a connection and talk to D through these wires. Okay, and what we've got is on each of these machines, okay, there is an electronic device called a network interface card or NIC for short. Okay. And what these network interface cards do is they translate all of the software side of things, actually on the machine, into the physical signals that go down these wires. Now, in the good old days, there was a standard called uh, thin wire Ethernet, which was literally like this. You had a, a piece of wire that ran around your office, and any computer you wanted to attach to it was physically tapped into that piece of wire, uh, by a, a very straightforward connection, there was no electronics involved. It was just a it was just a physical connector into this wire. There were some restrictions on how close you could put these things together, and they had to be spaced. Uh, I can't remember what the standard was now. Was it, a, was it a meter apart or one and a half meters? But there was a very specific distance that you had to have multiples of a particular distance to stop all sorts of problems. But basically, uh, the, if I remember rightly, the wire actually had little marks on it to show you what these distance, you know, where, where you could tap in. Anyway, getting off the topic, um, but it was literally like this, where you would just plug your machines into this, into the into the wire, the Ethernet wire that ran through. The Modern Ethernet systems don't work this way, um, uh, and we'll come on to that in a minute. We'll look at this in a in a, in a different way. Um, But you you will quite often see network diagrams drawn uh, simplistically like this. Okay, so let's say uh, I wanted to transfer uh, a one gigabit network uh, uh, file, a one gigabit file from A to D. Okay, now the naive way of doing it would be for A and D to agree to transfer data, and then to send the whole one gigabit file down this wire to D. OK, uh, the problem with that is, let's say it takes, uh, let's say it's not a very fast network and it takes, say, a, a full minute. Yeah? Uh, it takes one minute to transfer a gigabit file. OK, I mean, obviously in modern terms, that's ridiculous. It would probably take a second or so, or even on a uh, normal home network. But, but let's, let's say uh, uh, it takes a minute. That means that for the whole of that minute, this main wire here is occupied by any traffic going from A to D, which means that if C wanted to send a file to say B, what would happen is it, it would look and it would say, oh, the wire is busy. Uh, and so I have to wait. Okay, so it waits uh, and then it tries again. Oh, the wire is still busy. Waits, wire is still busy. Waits, wire is still busy. Now for a minute, if we're lucky, it says, ah, the wire's free now. I can now initiate the contact between C and B. Okay, the problem is, what if uh, I transfer this gigabit, okay, and then D immediately responds with a gigabit file back to A. Okay, now in the time that C uh, says, no, nope, it's still busy, A finishes, and D starts its transfer. Okay, so now D is writing to A for a minute. And C looks and says, no, the wire's still busy. So now it's been two minutes, okay, and C still can't send the data. Okay, so this is the naive uh, way of doing networking. In actual fact, uh, in the dim and distant past, uh, you, you would find networks that ran exactly like this, where, where if, a, if, a, if the wire was busy, um, these things uh, would would be blocked, uh, and you could end up in a situation where particular machines had trouble communicating. So to get around this, uh, what what networks do is they break this one gigabit file up, and they say rather than A connecting to D and sending the, the whole gigabit uh, whole gigabit file down, I will segment this file up. Okay, so I chop the whole, the whole, the whole file of it and I chop it up into bits. Okay, and each of these bits is a standard size. Uh, and just for the sake of argument, we'll say they are 
you know, 100 bit or byte, okay, per block, okay. So I, I chop this one gigabit file up into 100 byte blocks, okay, and I, I only send 100 bytes down the wire, okay. Then I have to negotiate again to get the wire, uh, and I send the next 100 bytes. Now, obviously, when C is looking, if you're transferring that 100 bytes, it will see, oh, the wire is busy. Okay, but in the time you're now thinking about sending the next 100 bytes, C can get in and can send 100 bytes of its own to B. Okay, so you've got these little packets now traveling down the wire. And as long as the wire, uh, as long as the 100 bytes is transferred nice and quickly, and there's a slight pause between each of the packets, that gives other people a chance to send their packets. Okay, so you can keep this wire very, very busy. So this wire can be absolutely 100% you know, stacked. Uh, so uh, you know, B could send a packet down the wire. Okay, and it, it, we're going, so, um, okay, so these are going this way. And these are going this way. Not at the same time, obviously. Uh, okay. But this 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 central wire can be a hundred percent busy, uh, but the machines themselves can be fifty percent busy or ten percent busy, or depending on you know how much traffic is going each way. So by dividing up into packets, uh, we allow much more utilization of the central corridor. Okay, and we allow different machines to communicate, uh, overlapping. Yeah, so no one machine gets to hog the central connection. Okay, so that's the rationale behind what are called packet networks. There are other advantages to packet networks as well. Uh, uh, and we'll see some of those in a minute. So what does a modern uh, modern network look like? Well, a modern network doesn't look quite like that. E even though schematically we might draw it that way. Okay. What we've got with a modern network is we've got machines A, we've got machine B, and we've got machine C, and we've got machine D. But most commonly, uh, what happens is those machines connect into a switch. Okay, and a switch is a device which has got network interface cards for each of the things connecting into it. Okay, and what this switch is responsible for doing is this switch is responsible for taking a packet from say device A and if it's destined for D then the switch takes it from this interface and writes it out to this interface. Okay, uh, and if he gets a packet from B arriving on this interface and this is addressed to, to device C then it goes out on this interface and so on. Yeah. So the switch is simply taking packets from one and going to the other. Okay, so that's a switch. Now, confusingly, a router does the same basic job. So what's the difference between a switch and a router? Mm -hmm. Okay, switches tend to be fairly comparatively uh, simple devices, uh, and switches all work on the same network. So all of these things are on the same physical network. Okay, a router on the other hand, okay, sits between networks. So all the machines on this network might very well connect via a switch to a router, and that router takes you to a n other network, and that could be the internet or whatever. Okay, we don't care at this point. So a router, generally speaking, routes between networks. Okay. Uh, the terminology between switch and routers, generally speaking, that's what you really mean. Okay, switches tend to be comparatively simple devices, uh, generally within uh, inside a network, and routers generally are between networks. Okay, um, but not necessarily, and that's what makes this so bloody confusing for everybody. All right. Uh, it's not quite that clear cut because uh, you know computers can act as routers and switches can act as routers and blah blah blah. Okay, it can get very confusing. Uh, for example, uh, 
Uh, a modern managed switch can actually have multiple networks going through it. Uh, and it can have a thing called a VLAN, which is a virtual network. Okay, and some ports can be on one network and some ports can be on another network. Some can be on multiple networks. So it can get, yeah, not quite as straightforward as it looks when you draw it out in one of these diagrams. Okay, all of that bladder aside, the long and the short of it is there are things which take uh, inputs from uh, one, one set of uh, computers and just directs the traffic as it were. Okay, and whether we call it a switch or a router it is academic for our exercise. All right. Okay, enough bother. Okay, in the best traditions of uh, salty vagrant, let's just actually run this. Uh, let's just do uh, right. I'm just going to create a completely new. Um, uh, now then, if I remember correctly, uh, we've actually got the two servers running, so uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to look, uh, I'm going to use the server that's already running and I'm going to be very naughty, I'm going to, I'm going to actually uh, uh, install some software on here directly. Uh, oh, at least I am. I learned to type. Uh, so, uh, what we're got, going to do is we're going to install two two bits of software. Uh, uh, one is called T Shock. Uh, the other one, uh, uh, T Mux. Uh, we, we've already got T Mux running on. The host, so I'm, I'm just going to SSH in twice. Okay, so we're, we're going to get uh, uh, at install T shock. Okay, and yeah, we'll just accept that. Okay, uh, and we will. Uh, no. um, I'm going to run it all as sudo. Okay, now just for the sake of this exercise, I'm going to open up a second terminal. Eons pass, continents collide. Why is things so slow? Oh. Mm. Okay, so all I've done now is I've logged in twice and as I uh, onto the same machine okay uh, so uh, I've now logged in twice onto the same machine um, uh, and I'm doing this in order that I can show you uh, how this works so we're going to start doing a capture now there are many ways of capturing network traffic, but for now we're going to use T Shark. Uh, so we're going to say on the Ethernet zero. Now remember, we've actually got two. Uh, we've got two network cards on this machine. Remember. Okay, so we've got Ethernet zero, uh, which is the connection to the host machine uh, and the host network. And Ethernet 1, which is the private network between the two machines. Well, I'm just going to, for the time being, I'm just going to do it um, uh, out to the Ethernet. Okay, so I'm going to monitor Ethernet 0. Now, I'm going to put a filter on, which says that it's not traffic destined for port SSH. So in other words, uh, it's not going to capture anything which is destined for port 22 or any port related to SSH. Uh, and uh, make it verbose and we're going to capture it in JSON format and we're going to write that out to a file called test JSON. Okay. So there we go. 
So we're now capturing, and on this side, all I'm going to do here is I'm going to run curl google.com, which is just going to get the, uh, the Google page like that. Okay, now we go back over here and we say control C. Now you can see it has captured 27 packets. Uh, uh, it captured 25 before I press control C. Okay, now if I look at test.json, which is the capture, okay, you can see here basically, and this is all I really wanted to show, is it just shows you um, the uh, the various the, the structure of the uh, data which has traveled over the ethernet um, interface okay so we start with uh, the frame okay and what you'll notice is it's actually done in layers okay so it, it is actually called layers okay so the frame layer is actually the the physical connection layer um, and largely we're going to ignore that because we don't use it very much uh, so the frame layer is the is the is the the very outside layer uh, and the actual fact uh, yeah, it's probably worth explaining yeah uh, okay uh, so if we go back to uh, here okay uh, yeah um, okay so uh, there's a thing called the OSI model uh, and uh, bear with me a second. Uh, right. Okay, you, you'll hear a lot of talk about uh, the OSI model. Um, And it, it's of, of limited use to us. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, network engineers use it a lot, but it's of limited use to us. Okay, but the but basically the OSI model uh, breaks up the network uh, stack into uh, different layers. Okay, so you've got uh, what's called the physical layer. Okay, now this deals with the actual. Um, uh, signals going down the wires okay so this is if you like um, uh, uh, the actual uh, 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 the the electronics that puts the positive and negative uh, electrical signals onto a physical wire okay that's the physical layer we don't really concern ourselves with the physical layer uh, then in that model there is the data link layer okay and that deals with the connection between two specific devices so between uh but you know once two devices are talking to each other uh, that deals with the actual physical network so it deals with things like uh, the mac addresses the actual physical layer right uh, then you've got the network layer Okay, and now the network layer <clears throat> controls how uh, the packets of data we talked about earlier, uh, how they move between uh, different parts of the network. Uh, so where the data link layer uh, mediates two physically connected nodes, so uh, you know, uh, A connected to the switch, for example, would be the data link layer, but the switch connected to the destination computer would be another data link layer okay but the two machines would be the mediated by the network layer okay uh, so uh, in our model we've got a talking to the switch okay and then that talking to machine b okay a packet going from a to b Okay, would actually go through uh, a physical connection between there and the switch. That's the data link layer. Okay, then the switch to B 
is also a data link layer. Okay, and the data link layer, okay, that's two transactions as far as the data link layer is concerned. But the connection from here to here is dealt with by the network layer. So A talking to B is connected by the network layer, and the network layer deals with the protocol between those two. Now, generally speaking, uh, as we're going to see in a minute, we deal with a slightly simpler model most of the time uh, when we're dealing with like uh, Linux machines, for example. Uh, anyway, uh, right, okay, so now we've got a, a new layer on top of that, which is the transport layer. Okay, uh, the transport layer uh, deals with reliability issues. Okay, so whereas the network layer just says, okay, A and B, uh, it deals with the actual tra uh, transaction between those two nodes. The transport layer deals with, um, if you like, the, the meta layer above that. So it's not concerned with the actual connection. It's concerned with uh, protocols dealing with, uh, for example, uh, confirming that uh, a piece of data has gone from A to B. Okay, so where the network layer just says, <clears throat> this is the connection between A and B, the transport layer deals with the uh, intricacies of uh, uh, confirmation that, uh, that a piece of data has gone from A to B, for example. Okay, now above that uh, is the session layer. Now the session layer, uh, that deals with uh, maintaining uh, an ongoing connection. So all of these layers are really just concerned with a single transaction between two parts of the network. Okay, Session is the ongoing transaction. So if I'm transferring that file, remember, Okay, so I've got my file and I've broken it up into hundreds of little bits. Okay, each of those little bits is really dealt with at this layer, uh, transport and down. But the whole file uh, is dealt with by the session layer because the session main, maintains that connection and, and mediates that connection for the entire uh, length of that transaction. <clears throat> uh, above that, we have the presentation layer. Okay. And the presentation layer um, is really uh, it's 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 a translation layer. Okay, so it translates between the intricacies of these lower levels and the layer above it, uh, which is the last layer, which is the application layer. So uh, for example, uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, encryption. Uh, encryption might be dealt with at the presentation layer. Okay, uh, so uh, the application layer. Okay doesn't really want to be concerned with encryption, but nor does the session layer. So the presentation layer deals with that kind of complexity. Okay, so it, it does the translation. Same with compression. Okay, the application layer, generally speaking, the application doesn't really care about whether the data is compressed going over the network or not. All it cares about is I want to make a connection to another machine and send some data to it. Similarly, the session layer, uh, it says, well, I've got a chunk of data and all I'm going to do is make sure that it, it gets to be in a coherent in a coherent way. <clears throat> so compression is all in this presentation layer. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the, uh, the OSI model. Uh, 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 which is all well and good, uh, but we're gonna we're gonna simplify it, <clears throat> okay? And uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so we're gonna simplify it because for the most part, and here's where things get mushy, okay? Uh, these things overlap, 
uh, a lot. Uh, so we're going to simplify it, okay? And we're going to simplify it in, in the TCP IP stack, which is the one we're going to deal with. Okay, so the TCP IP stack is the one you're going to encounter most often for most network purposes, okay? So although the OSI model is great and all that, um, it's very seldom that you come across something which is as nicely delineated as this. And the TCP IP stack is a good example, okay? So the TCP IP stack, okay, uh, breaks things up differently. Uh, so these... Uh, yeah, uh, these three layers here, uh, uh, are sort of joined together. They all overlap. They're all joined together in the application layer. Okay, so uh, so this is uh, OSI model. This is the TCP IP stack. Like I said, that's the what the TCP IP stack is the one that we're going to be concerned with mainly. Okay, now beneath the, uh, yeah, beneath that we've got the transport there, uh, which is essentially the same thing as in the OSO model. And instead of calling it the network layer, okay, we call it the internet layer. Okay, uh, so that's transport still. Okay, and then the data link layer and below, uh, we just call that the network access because uh, that's a network access layer. Okay, so uh, that so as you can see, the TCP/IP is just one, two, three, four layers. Okay, and the OSI is seven. Okay, um, and the TCP/IP layer basically lumps together a whole load of stuff into the application layer. Uh, right. Now, TCP IP. Mm -hmm. Right. The IP network, okay, the TCP IP refers to the two parts of uh, the main protocol, okay? So we've got the IP layer, uh, which is the internet protocol, which I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear, is basically talking about this layer here, okay? And the TCP layer, which predominantly is about this transport layer, but it kind of bleeds over. So it's not, it, 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 it's sort of, you know, in this layer somewhere. Okay, so TCP I sort of crosses a bit into here because it really deals with sessions and stuff as well. We'll we'll see that in a minute. Right. Okay. Okay. So that's the the, the this, if you like, is the textbook uh, model uh, that everybody talks about, uh, but very few people really care about unless you're a network engineer and you're dealing with a lot of different protocols and. and types of network, the chances are, although it's useful to know the OSI model, it's not really of practical use, in my opinion, uh, if you're a devops -y type person. But the TCP IP stack, totally, you really need to understand at least the rudiments of the way the TCP IP stack work in order for us to talk about this. Right, now then. Let's talk about uh, data. Yes. Okay. So this is a real piece of a block of a block of data. Let's call it a block of data. Okay. It's a packet. Okay. You can see here. Here's a packet. Okay. Uh, and it's uh, pcap is the packet capture file, right? uh, which is what T Shark actually has presented us with. Uh, now. This is uh, in total. Okay. It, 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 Ignoring for a moment the uh, uh, ignoring for a moment the um, uh, the 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 models we've just discussed. Okay, this is a, a block of data, right? Uh, and we're going to chop it up. So let's 
Okay, so this is a block of data which has arrived at our network interface card. Uh, and so our network interface card has received a block of data and it has handed it to a piece of software. Right? Now, for the sake of argument, uh, we've got uh, some data about this block of data. Okay, uh, and this is our our frame data, right? So it tells us some useful information about things like the uh, interface it was captured on, that kind of stuff. Uh, but it only really gets interesting once we get down below that level. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you won't make a huge amount of use of the frame part. Okay, so the frame part, uh, this is our frame, let's call it the frame header. Uh, and we're not really going to be interested in that. Right. Uh, right, next, next is uh, Ethernet. Uh, so the Ethernet header. Uh, is going to tell us information primarily about the network access layer. Okay, uh, so it's primarily talking about the uh, on on the OSI model. Okay, we were talking about the data link layer, which connects two physical devices, and that's what this Ethernet header is telling us. Okay, so you can see here that we've got. Uh, the source and destination, all right? Uh, so this is essentially the data link layer because it's two physical devices that are talking to each other. In this case, uh, we've got two um, MAC addresses. Uh, okay, so this one and this one. Okay, this one's the source. This one's the destination. Uh, okay and um, the source in this instance okay is our guest vm and the destination is the virtual box dns server uh, which is actually a, uh, a well they're, i mean they're both software devices because of course it's a virtual machine okay um, uh, Uh, yeah, but what you'll notice is that we're only using the uh, uh, MAC addresses. So these are physical things. Uh, now, confusingly, because it's a virtual environment, they're actually fake physical things. So they're actually bits of software. But just bear with it, okay? So that's the data link there. If these were if these were actual physical machines, okay? So one was the switch and one was the uh, computer then they, they would be the mac addresses of the network interface cards that are actually physically connected by a piece of wire uh, right uh, let me see you can uh, uh, yeah we can actually see this can't we uh, Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Uh, so, so let's go across to. Oops, uh, let's go across to here. Uh, and uh, now, what is it? Is it IP op? Ah, no. Uh, IP, uh, oh, IP link would do. Uh, hmm. Right, so uh, we can see here this is the fake MAC address of the actual Ethernet one. Okay, and that is the same as this. MAC address. So we know that the source 
is this Ethernet one here. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, uh, so if we do, uh, uh, so this is the uh, mapping between the IP addresses and the uh, MAC addresses uh, on this local server. So the machines it knows about, machines it's physically connected to. So these are the these are the network interface cards that it, it thinks is uh, there. Okay, so uh, the source we've already identified as being Ethernet. Uh, zero that we got by looking at the uh, actual interface cards on this machine okay but if we want to know what this one is the thing it's talking to the destination we have to look it up in the uh, what's called the arc table okay which is the mapping between the physical network interface card and the IP addresses that are known on that device all right so here we've got uh, 5254 and it ends 2503, so 2503, okay, so you can see here, and that is the IP address 102.3, okay, and 102.3 is the uh, uh, VMware uh, router, okay, and uh, if we uh, look here, uh, you can see that it's the uh, it's the name server. Sorry, not the router. The name server. The the, the router is ten two two. So ten two three is the name server. So this is looking up Google.com for us. Okay, and this packet is the start of that process. Okay. Uh, right. So that's the. Uh, that's the uh, Ethernet header, uh, which you recall. Uh, that's our data link. So we talk, we talk, we're, we're, we're talking about the physical machines talking to each other at this point. All right. Uh, so the next part of the frame, the next part of the, the block of data, okay, is the IP block, just here. All right. Now, uh, IP comes in two flavors. Uh, four and six. Uh, four, for our sins, is still by far the most common, uh, and it's the one that you'll be familiar with with these IP addresses like this. Uh, you know, ten dot zero dot two dot one five or whatever. Okay, you get the four uh, bytes, uh, which are um, uh, uh, the address. Uh, the internet protocol address now uh, as i'm sure everybody knows there's a big panic uh, about ip addresses running out <coughs> there have been various workarounds uh, but basically yeah we're, we're going to run out <laughs> uh, sooner or later uh, because it's a fairly limited uh, address space when it was created uh, back in the 60s and 70s uh, uh, mostly the 60s i think uh, it seemed like a lot of space because yeah? it's 255 times 255 times 255 times 255 which seems massive when you're really talking about mainframes uh, uh, but with the advent of the personal computer uh, of course we've got a lot of machines now 
uh, attached to networks. So to get around the problem of IP4 addresses running out, certain addresses have been set aside and are not considered to be part of the internet address space. They are local, examples of which are any address beginning with 10, uh, any address beginning with 192.168. These are not considered to be internet addresses. They are for private networks uh, that are not to be connected to the internet. So you'll never find uh, a service on the internet with an address 10 dot something or with a, an address 192.168 something. Uh, the other one uh, is 172.16 uh, and there's another one as well. Anyway, the point is there are these address spaces uh, that are uh, not considered to be part of the, uh, and the idea is that if you've got a large network, uh, if, if you've got a home network, uh, the, the chances are, unless you've set it up differently, the chances are it's your uh, computer's local address will be 192.168. And it's usually either dot zero or dot one. Uh, and then some number. And that's fine uh, because that gives you on your home network uh, the potential to address uh, 255 times 255 uh, uh, yeah 255 times 255 machines probably enough for your home uh, If you've got a large network, like you're an enterprise or something like that, then you might very well use the 10.0 or 10 dot, 10 dot name namespace, because that gives you 255 times 255 times 255 machines on your network, uh, potentially. Uh, or you can divide it up into multiple networks, and we'll talk about that later. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Uh, where was I? I've, I've gone off on a tangent, haven't I? But yeah, IPv4. Okay. Anyway, so IPv4 address is running out. Uh, so they invented or created IPv6. Now IPv6 has got enough addresses in it to, uh, I can't remember what the hyperbole was now, but it's like address every atom in the universe or something. It's big. It's a very big, you can uniquely identify lots and lots of devices. Now this becomes increasingly important because with the Internet of Things coming about and the fact that people now have mobile devices that are shifting around, uh, becoming increasingly important for us to have a bigger address space. So uh, there has been an effort, uh, albeit not overly successful one, uh, over the past, uh, sort of, uh, what was it now? Crikey, it must be 20 years now. Uh, so try and get people to move from IPv4 to IPv6. It has to be said, yeah, there's still quite a way to go. Uh, there's an awful lot of basic infrastructure uh, that still needs to be moved to IPv6. And unfortunately, until it's all there, uh, the real usefulness of IPv6 uh, doesn't really come to the fore. Uh, IPv6 has, has got a lot going for it in terms of, for example, uh, it, it makes routing much more accurate and much simpler uh, than with the IPv4. Um, uh, as well as, as I say, the fact that every single device can have a unique address that will apply wherever it is. However, uh, come to think of it, that's, that's also fairly uh, 1984-ish, isn't it? If you've got a a unique IP address, then you're easier to track. Hmm. I thought about that. Yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about IPv6 uh, at, at a later date. For now, 99 times out of 100, you're going to come across IPv4, so we'll talk about that. Okay, so we've got our uh, Ethernet frame, which, as we talked, is our data link. That's our two physical devices talking to each other. If you remember from the RSI model, if we go back to the RSI model, uh, oops. Uh, then, so that's uh, all taking place in the data link layer, okay, uh, or network access layer. 
Now we're at the internet layer or network layer if you're on the OSI model. Okay, and this is basically IP. All right. So now we're now talking about the next header, which is our IP. Okay. So uh, where was I? Yeah, so we're on IPv4. Uh, uh, IPv4. I'm not sure why that didn't automatically change. Oh well. Uh, and what we are really concerned with here, uh, you can see there's an awful lot of uh, gubbins uh, that we can use, but what we're really interested in here is uh, the source address, okay, which is 10.0.2.15, which if you remember is the actual address of this machine. Uh, okay, so that's the address of this machine on this Ethernet zero. Yeah? Uh, that's the source address. Uh, and the destination address is 1023. Okay, now as it happens, we're only talking to the local name server, so <coughs> that's on the same network segment. It also happens to be the machine we're physically connected to. All right, uh, but this is important, it doesn't have to be. Okay, it could be that that IP address refers to a machine a long way away not the one that corresponds to this ethernet frame okay that's that uh, next we talk about the transport layer okay so we're now at the transport layer which mercifully is the same name in both okay and with the transport layer uh, we're now talking about Uh, uh, so the transport layer uh, is now talking uh, about the actual protocol, right? So uh, in this case, uh, UDP. Okay, so we're now uh, at this level. Uh, we're really talking about uh, the uh, uh, yeah, uh, so that's the IP. Now we're talking about the transport layer, which is UDP. Now remember, the transport layer is responsible for um, getting the packets uh, there and back. Right? Uh, as it happens, we're using UDP for this, and UDP by design is um, is it, it is not a synchronized uh, data flow. So there's no there's no, uh, I'm sending you some data, you tell me you've got the data, okay, uh, which as we'll see is the whole point about TCP. UDP is more efficient in some respects because what it does is it just says, I'm sending some data. And if it doesn't get a response in a reasonable time, it will generally speak and send the data again. It will just say, send the data again. If it does get a response in a reasonable time, then it, it just forgets. Okay, but there's no, uh, but that, that's the uh, 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 that's the transport layer. Is is that in this case resending the data? Okay, so UDP is an unreliable data protocol. Uh, so that's what this bit of the packet does. Okay, so that's the UDP header. Now, above that, uh, you can see we've got a DNS layer, okay? And the DNS layer uh, Okay, so the DNS packet is here, okay? And that is the application layer, all right? So that's this, that's this application layer, all right? Which is, in this case, is all of these things bundled together, but the application layer, Okay, so DNS is the application layer. Okay, so we've got application layer, uh, we've got the transport layer, we've got the uh, internet layer, uh, we've got the data link layer, right? and uh, this is really the data link layer, these two things here. Right? Okay, so that's 
the basic structure of a packet uh, right and all of these useful things in here okay particularly ethernet down so the um, uh, the data link down okay uh, is useful to us when we're writing uh, firewalls or any kind of routing and that kind of stuff okay because we, we've got access to most of this data uh, to make decisions about uh, is this packet something we're interested in is it something that we want to pass on to another machine uh, is it something we want to give to an application that we are running on our system uh, is it something that we want to get rid of and ignore uh, is it a potential security risk mm -hmm. uh, now under normal circumstances the only traffic we will see the only the only network traffic we'll see is stuff that's intended for this physical device now remember uh, back here uh, okay this data link and physical layer right? uh, and we're talking now about uh, uh, this will do okay so we've got two these two physical things talking to each other there so we've got a network interface card here and a network interface card here talking to each other a physical piece of wire they take care of a lot of the nonsense um, and of course the switch will ignore information if we were back here in the good old days right, um, again uh, you know this network interface card and this network interface card could look at traffic traveling down this piece of wire and they would know whether or not that traffic was destined for them by the data link layer which would have the mac address okay and the actual physical hardware would simply ignore uh, things that were not relevant and by and large that's the way uh, our systems will work today but you can uh, be promiscuous okay you can you can say i want to look at all of the traffic traveling along this network okay and i want to actually be able to uh, process all of it and we'll see that routers generally speaking are at a point in the network where they can see an awful lot of network traffic and make decisions about what's appropriate and what isn't okay <clears throat> okay so that is uh the basic structure of a a data frame okay so a block of data which has come down the wire uh, and we can go down and we can look at other frames okay so uh, here's another frame okay uh, so the, here's the frame layer and we can see that this again is these two physical devices connected to each other uh, and in this case uh, let's see the destination uh, and the source are uh, the other way around uh, or not uh, that's the query uh, let's go down and uh, let's just search for uh, uh, not the greatest thing to search for here we go here's an http uh, application frame All right so we can actually go up here um, okay, so here's a frame. All right. Ooh, that was a bit of a warning, mate. Very really windy out there. Uh, well, that was rattling in there. Mm -hmm. Must be getting windy in the roof. Right. Uh, yeah, so what we've got here, uh, we've now got, uh, again, the same two physical devices talking to each other. Uh, uh, no, I lie. You can see this is 3502. 3502 is this 2.2.2. 2.2 .2 .2, uh, .2 here. Okay. Uh, I don't know why that's not selecting all of them. Anyway, uh, the point being. Uh, Okay, uh, so it's this 222, uh, T2 address, yeah? 3502, uh, which is actually the uh, the virtual router out to the internet, which is actually our local 
network. So what you've got here, okay, is the destination address uh, being that router and uh, the source address being B923, which is the uh, machine we're on. And we've got the IP packet, okay. But there we go. Now this is interesting. Okay, so those are the two physical devices that are connected together. And then uh, let's go. Yeah. Oops. I'm showing you all this stuff, and I'm not really showing you. Okay. So two two two. Uh, okay. That's this thirty five oh two, which in this frame. Okay. Is here. So this is the. Ethernet frame 2502, that's the destination. Okay, and the source of the packet is this 29 uh, B923, okay, which is this one down over here, okay, which is our, our physical machine. So that's the Ethernet card on our server one connecting to the uh, the, the uh, router out to our, out to our uh, internet. That's the physical connection. But, and this is the important point, the IP frame, okay, uh, which is the, the network connection, if you remember that connects to nodes on the network. It's got nothing to do with the physical connection now. This is the, the two things that are communicating. And that is our machine, 10 to 15, and the destination, which is now 216.58.212.238, which is actually a Google server somewhere. All right. uh, and the TCP, okay, remember last time it was UDP, because we were talking to a name server, which uses the UDP protocol. This is the TCP protocol. So now, uh, so now our frame has got Ethernet. Uh, it's got the frame header and the Ethernet the same. It's got an IP frame, which is the same, or an IP block. Uh, but now, instead of UDP, which is which was for our DNS service, okay, we've now got a TCP frame here. Okay, so remember that is. Uh, so that is our transport. Yeah, so the TCP is our transport this time. So TCP transport. <coughs> uh, we can ignore all of this stuff for now. Uh, uh, but this time we've actually got some data traveling down there. Right? Uh, and that data is an HTTP, Ta -da! which is our application, All right? So again, coming back to here, okay, we've got TCP, and this time we've got HTTP traffic. Okay, so the, the last block, our application, our application block, okay, is this time is HTTP. And in actual fact, we can look inside that, Okay, and we can see that this is a GET request. All right, and if we'd followed the, if we'd followed the, oops, uh, let's go back again. Okay, so it's a GET request, okay, within the HTTP, all right? Now, uh, if we'd followed the exchange all the way down, and we, and we could do by, by going back and going through the, <coughs> going through all of the packets we've seen so far, okay? So we, we had a request to a DNS service, Okay, to get uh, the IP address of google.com. Uh, we won't go through all the details of DNS at the moment because it's not important to what we're looking at. Right? Then there would have been a whole load of exchange stuff and eventually we would have got back the IP address. Okay, now we're in a position where we can make a request to that IP address and that's exactly what we're doing here. Okay, 
So if, you, if we go back up here, this is now making a request, okay? Now, the physical connection, remember, still remains between, probably worth drawing this out. Okay, so the physical address, or the physical connection, is still between our VM, okay, uh, which is IP address 10, 0, 2, 15, okay, but more importantly, it has a MAC address ending B923. Okay, so the physical NIC, the network interface card on this virtual machine. And I keep saying that, but yes, it's virtual, but for the purposes of this exercise, we'll treat it if it's not. Okay, so physically, the wire connecting B923, okay, to, in this case, it's the, the virtual router. Okay, which is at address ten zero two two. Okay, and has the uh, MAC address ending thirty five o two. Okay, now remember that is the data link layer. Okay, so that is the physical connection between the two things that are actually transferring this data. Right. But when we get up above that, okay, to the IP layer, okay, so this IP layer, okay, you'll notice that the two the two nodes, they're not physically connected machines anymore, okay, are actually a machine out here on the internet with address two one six, was it two one six fifty eight. Uh, two one two two three eight. Okay, so we're not physically connected. That there's a whole load of network crap in the middle here. Okay, but this node is talking to this node, and that's what the IP layer is doing. Okay, and then the TCP layer is ensuring that connection and doing all of the exchange. Blah blah blah. Okay. And the HTTP layer is telling us what's actually going on. Okay, so you can see this is a request to google.com. Okay, so this machine here, back again. So this machine here is google.com. Okay, uh, and as we'll see when we get into more of the networking type stuff, okay, it's not necessarily the same machine on google.com, but. Uh, at the moment, we'll just think of that as being google.com, right? And uh, you can see that uh, the structure of the data here is basically saying, right, I'm, I'm, I'm asking google.com for some data. Uh, and the thing I'm asking for is this URI, which is really just the home page of Google. Okay. Next frame. Okay, so the next frame you can see here that the destination and the source have been switched around. Oh no! All right, so now this is a packet flowing this way. Okay, so it's coming from 1002 to here. Notice the physical connection hasn't changed. Yeah. We're still connected to physical devices still connected so the data frame is exactly the same except we've switched the source and the destination around okay when we look at the ip address you can see now that the source of this packet is this machine over here okay so okay so the source of this packet is the 21658 machine and the destination is the 10215. Okay. So, so what we've done now is we've said, okay, the, the original request was going from here to here. But now the response is going from here to here. Okay. And that's what the packet is telling us. Okay. So the packet is telling us, okay, the, the source and destination have switched around at the IP level. And at the data frame level, 
but remember remember at the data frame level the two physically connected machines are these two machines okay but the packet has traveled from here to here and then gone out over the network and there'll be loads of machines in between and arrived here okay this machine has now sent the packet back through a whole load of network stuff da, 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 that we don't care about any of this it arrived back here and this machine has now forwarded to this machine okay so the physical connection is between these two machines here okay that is what the uh, data frame is telling us yeah ethernet data frame the ip is telling us about about the big picture yeah? the two nodes that are connected next uh, next up uh, is again a tcp frame so again we are we're up here okay so we're sending a packet back now it's still a tcp um transport layer uh, uh, okay uh, and this time uh, we go down and down and down and down uh, uh, and it was sent back uh, probably some sort of acknowledgement uh, okay so it sent back an acknowledgement and then uh, right now we're making another request packet and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> ah, right here we go so this is the actual meat and potatoes now okay so the source is the google server over here and unsurprisingly the destination is our machine again we're talking about the IP layer remember okay and the IP layer is uh, this layer here so we're not talking about the physical connection anymore we're talking about the node connections okay uh, so that's that's showing us that the two nodes are connected and it's coming from the Google server back to us. Again, it's a TCP uh, transport layer packet and it's got a whole load of data in it, which when we when we disassemble this data, okay, because to remember, remember to the TCP layer, it's just a block of numbers. Okay, and that's the block of numbers and that block of numbers is some header information but more importantly it's this application layer packet data okay which is the http packet which when we interpret it using the http application protocol we can see all sorts of information most importantly for our purposes is the data which comes along with it Okay, which happens to be the um, HTML, which is what we got back from uh, the server. That's it. Uh, the rest of it is just meat and potato stuff about acknowledging and blah blah blah. Yeah, we've done we've done the the basic job of getting the web page. Uh, so that's it, really. Um, that is uh, how packets are exchanged so where does all this leave us with respect to um, firewalls okay there are two things to understand or two main things to understand uh, about the way the packets are directed through our system okay there is routing and then there is 
uh, the network filters. So let's take a look at routing. Uh, on our machine, okay, this is the root table, the routing table, okay, and what this does, in essence, uh, it's a lookup table. So when our packet says something like, uh, I want to go to uh, 216.58.212.238, okay, which is the Google server. It looks down this list and it tries to get the best match on the left hand side here. Okay, so it says, is it an address starting 10.02? No. Is it an address starting 192? No. Is it an address starting? No. Right. Okay, so I need to pass this packet to the default, which is 10.022. And that's exactly what we see. Okay. And that's the reason why. It physically gets passed to this machine here. Okay, so the routing table makes this decision about which machine the packet should go to next. Uh, and in actual fact, uh, we can probably. Uh, uh, I don't know. Oh, it is installed. Cool. Okay. Uh, so if I do trace route to. Google.com, right? Okay, so uh, trace route basically just follows the various hops through the network, right? So you can see uh, the first place it goes is to 10. Uh, uh, good if I'd switch the screen. Okay, so the trace route uh, is going trace route to Google, okay, which is the 216.58.204.46 at this point. Okay, it's a, it's a different IP address, don't worry. Uh, it's still Google, okay, uh, and you can see the first hop is to the physically connected device, right, which is this hop here, okay, and that is determined by our, our routing table, okay, so our routing table decides this first hop. Okay, now from that machine, which is the uh, virtual uh, the virtual router yeah, on VirtualBox, uh, it then goes on to my own home network. Uh, and so what it then goes is it goes to the name server, which sits on my uh, home server at 192.168.1254, right? Uh, why not dot one which is more typical uh, long and complicated story basically dot one is the switch that i use but it doesn't it switches don't show up on this uh, so it goes to uh, the name server so my name server uh, is also my gateway router uh, I, I could have put like a gateway name in there but it's, it's, oh, there's only one name uh, it's, it happens to be called the name server so that is my gateway right then from there, it ho uh, now the the point being that the routing table on the uh, on that machine on this one nine two one six eight one two five four machine will say the default gateway is actually my ISP modem, which is at one nine two one six eight zero one. Okay, it's actually a physically separate. Um, Interface. So on my home network, okay. What we uh, here's what we got. Here's the story so far. Okay, ten dot zero dot two dot fifteen. That is the VM. Okay. So hop one. Hop one was determined by our IP route on this machine. Okay. And it goes to the physically connected machine. Remember, it can only hop to things that it knows about machines that it, it physically knows about. Right. So that goes to 10.0.2.2, .2, which is our virtual box root router. Okay. And from there, its root table will say, well, okay, the next hop, okay, is to go to, uh, in actual fact, it's going to a bridging network. Okay. But it goes to the lab. Okay. 
And the LAN says, okay, uh, the default gateway for this LAN is 192.168.1.254. Okay, and that is my gateway router server. Okay, and its IP route. Okay, its IP route says the default gateway for any traffic coming in. Uh, and I, I don't know whether it is Ethernet, it's, 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 it won't be Ethernet 0, it will be ENP0S1 or something like that. Uh, so anything coming in on this this network card, which is physically connected to the local area network, gets routed by default to a, a separate network interface card, okay, which is connected to the network, which also hosts 192.168. 0 0.1 okay and this is my isp modem uh, right from there it goes out to my isp okay and is uh, to all intents and purposes a, a black box okay and that's why uh, you get a lot of little stars like this, which means there's a hop in there somewhere, but we haven't got any details about it. Then you'll see it goes to this, which is virginmedia.net, which is my ISP, Virgin Media. Okay, so it's going to some server in their infrastructure. Uh, and there's a whole load of other net uh, hops, which could be anything, could be you know, physical applications, or uh, sorry, um, it could be uh, uh, devices sitting on the network somewhere. Uh, then it goes to another server on their internal network, and you can see it's it's a it's a different network. Okay, so these these are internal routers probably. All right. Uh, then it goes out to yet another Virgin Media machine. Uh, then to uh, ooh, some mysterious. Uh, oh, oh, this is um, <laughs> this is Google. All right, so this is the final destination machine. But you can see it's not called google.com on their internal infrastructure. It's called <coughs> uh, what LHR25S12-in-F14. Okay, and 1E100 is just Google being cute. Okay, 1E100 is a Google, uh, which is where Google gets its name. Uh, but basically, we don't really care. Okay, let's just, just out of curiosity, let's let's try this. Uh, uh, let's do trace route again. Okay, now this time you can see it's arrived at a different machine. Okay, so even though we've we've done the same, basically the same request. Okay, you can see it's arrived at a different Google machine. Uh, we don't care. Because uh, as far as the system's concerned, they're all Google.com. But you can see, up until it leaves my network, it's the same. 1022, and it goes to the uh, gateway router. And it goes to the ISP modem. Then it goes through a whole load of junk on the media network, uh, sorry, Virgin Media Network. Okay, and again, uh, you can see that th this, is, uh, this is all... Um, uh, different. Yeah. Uh, it's coming out somewhere, being bounced around a couple of other servers, and eventually ends up at Google. Okay, so this was 12 hops, whereas the first time we did it in 10 hops. And that is the resilience of, of packet networks, is it doesn't have to follow the same route. Okay, uh, so uh, when you're when it's bouncing around, okay, between here as it leaves my network okay it goes through the virgin media network uh, then it goes out to some somewhere on the internet and eventually ends up at google right. now the point is that google's internal network will have loads of machines in it all right so our packet uh, follows the same path until it gets to here all right but once it gets to here uh, it can go through any number of different set setups. Okay, so it could go through 
any number of machines. It could go bounce, 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 or it might go. It might go bounce, 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 uh, bounce, bounce. So it, it doesn't necessarily go through the same set of machines. Uh, and that is shown here when we do this trace route. Uh, okay, so when we, when we do this trace route, uh, you can see that we get bounced with different machines uh, each time we do the request. Uh, so we do it again. Uh, so like, oh, 12 bounces again. Okay, but you can see it's a different set of machines because bounce 10 here was a 172 machine. It's a 209 machine over here. Okay, now uh, uh, the point is that the routing decisions uh, for on on my internal network, the routing decisions are pretty fixed. Okay, there's no there's no cleverness on on my internal network because there's no need to. There's no need to load balance or you know distribute the load across uh, my network. Uh, I don't care. And, and there isn't the idea of uh, selecting the best network connection, uh, which is something that does happen on the internet as a whole. Okay, So the reason why it can take different routes is because uh, a packet might arrive at a machine, Okay, and its routing strategy uh, will look at the networks it's, uh, it's attached to, and it will say, well, this one's actually not very loaded at the moment, but this one is. So I will send it down the less loaded network, okay? And that's the reason why you see these these different net, uh, these different machines being used yeah? is because the routing strategies of large networks are much more sophisticated, and they're more concerned with how busy is this network connection uh, compared to this one. Uh, so it's always trying to find the most efficient way of sending packets through its own internal networks which is the reason why it gets bounced around to different machines. <coughs> Whereas on like a, a home network like I've got, I don't need to worry about, well, which network is the most efficient. Uh, there are only two or three networks internally anyway. Uh, so it always goes through the same set of machines, uh, which is the reason why the first few hops, one, two, three, yeah, the first three hops will always be the same three machines. Okay, and that's because these are static routing tables. Yeah, there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing clever about these routing tables. We could make them clever, but there's no reason because uh, there isn't a problem that one network in, in my house gets very, very busy or so busy that it, it is of benefit to send packets down another one. Uh, right. That was how long. Uh, about 15 minutes about routing. <laughs> now, there are reams and reams of books written about routing, and I am not a network engineer. Uh, but that's the that's the basic idea. Okay, so routing is is primarily about the physical machines that A knows it's connected to. Okay, so this virtual machine knows that it's connected to a limited number of machines okay in this case it's connected to a set of machines on this network a set of machines on this network and a set of machines on this network right. uh, and so it knows where to send packets that are addressed to those networks if it comes across something like google which is a network it doesn't know about then it will send it to this default. Right? Now the default happens to be this network. Right? But it won't it won't send it via this rule, it will send it via this default rule. And this default rule very clearly says send it to device uh, uh, a physical device Ethernet zero on the virtual machine and send it to this address. And that address is a router which will then have its own set of rules to say how to send the packet on to the next physical device, which, as it happens, is the host computer. Okay, the host computer then has a set of rules which tells it where to send it, and so on. Right, actually, that was a bit of a lie. 
it happens that VirtualBox server will pick up whatever default root the host has. Um, so in this case, it knows to send it straight to uh, my gateway machine. Okay, uh, and so that, that's how the packet goes. Okay, it, it's it's physically connected machines. Okay. Okay. Uh, even that's a bit of a lie, because <laughs> because uh, this machine and this machine are not physically connected as such. Okay, it actually goes through a switch, but the switch for the purposes of this exercise is anonymous. It doesn't get involved uh, in 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 the root. Uh, uh, it does get involved in the data link layer. But it doesn't get involved in the room. Right, anyway, uh, okay, uh, I don't want to get bogged down. Okay, <coughs> so routing is one way uh, the packets throw, th flow through the system. The other way, and the way that is of concern to us for firewalls, is the net filters. Now, we briefly had a look at this the other day. Uh, I think actually. Yeah, we've already run uh, IP, so we've got the default uh, change now. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go into this in detail, uh, mainly because it's a whole session on its own. Uh, but, right. In essence, network file uh, uh, sorry, network filters are uh, a set of rules that say whether a packet, and recall we're talking about, about these packets, okay, the ones that we've been looking at, okay, so these, these packets that we've been looking at, okay, and it uses the information in these packets to make decisions about whether or not uh, the packet, what should happen to that piece of data, that packet. Uh, and amongst other things, uh, but the primary thing that we're, we're concerned with is do we want to uh, accept the packet uh, to the machine itself, in which case it will get sent to its destination Will be the application. Do we want to drop the packet? In which case the packet will just be ignored. Or do we want to reject the packet? In which case the packet will be both ignored and we will send a message back to the original machine to say uh, we're not accepting this packet. Uh, now there are other things we can do, uh, but broadly speaking, those are the important ones. For the per for our purposes, okay, we, we we can do all sorts of things as well. We can we can actually manipulate the package and do stuff to it as part of the net filter process, and we'll we'll see some of that. But for now, the main thing we want to do is either uh, accept the packet, drop it, or reject it. Now, uh, a word about dropping and rejecting for. Gateway firewalls, that is to say, firewalls between, uh, in particular, between your internal network and the internet at large. Generally speaking, you want to just drop packets. Okay, so if a bad actor is attempting to connect your network, uh, it will come in and the firewall will just ignore the packet completely. It will just blanket. It won't respond in any way. Uh, on the whole, that's a good thing when you're talking about the, the internet because it doesn't give any clues about your network or the device it's talking to. Okay, All it does is just say, nah, I'm not here. Uh, I'm just ignoring you. Uh, in actual fact, it doesn't even confirm that it's not there. The packet just disappears. Right? If you have your external firewall 
set to reject packets, then that gives clues to um, the bad actor about what is going on. Okay, so they can use, for example, the timing of, of how long it takes for the packet to be rejected to determine things about the location of your server, uh, of your firewall, possibly about the type of firewall, depending on features about the packet which is sent to reject it. You know? um, so generally speaking, uh, you don't want to reject pack, uh, packets that come from the internet. Uh, if you don't want to deal with them, you don't want to accept them, then just drop them. Also, on your internal networks, typically dropping the packet makes more sense. Because every time you reject a packet, that, that's another piece of data noise on your network. So why have reject at all? Well, first of all, historically, uh, because you know, before we had assholes in the world, was that ever the case? Uh, sending a reject was a good thing because it let the other machine that was trying to contact you know that it had screwed up somehow. But either it was accidentally connected to the wrong machine or it was doing something wrong in terms of talking to you. Um, you know, uh, it could be rejected because the service was down or wasn't available. Uh, and that's a, that's a good thing. Okay, so on your internal network, you might say, well, why don't we reject you know, those packets? To which I say, no, if you want to reject packets, I would say only reject packets for very specific reasons. And that way that can be used as a diagnostic tool. Generally speaking, you don't want the noise of those packets going back. If somebody's trying to connect your machine uh, and is sending you a packet which can't be handled, then dropping it just it, it knows that it screwed up somehow because it's not getting a response. Either the machine's down, the service is down, or it's connected to the wrong machine, but something's wrong. So the failure point is still under your control because it's on your internal network. <clears throat> um, so the rejection in that case probably isn't adding a great deal. Um, there are reasons for sending rejects, but generally speaking, keep the noise low uh, and, and don't bother rejecting. Um, so yeah, uh, generally speaking, the default uh, policy, okay, and you can see the policy over here, okay, um, okay, so the policy here. Uh, at the moment, we haven't set up anything to do in our rule set. Uh, we've not set up anything, so the policy is accept. So all packets will be accepted um, by default. Once we've got things uh, started on this rule, uh, and if we were to set the policy to anything other than accept now, we would cause havoc. Uh, so, but eventually we'll change this to be the policy of drop, which means that anything which isn't explicitly dealt with by another rule will just silently be dropped. Okay. Now then, there are a few things we can see here. Uh, this is obviously a rule. Uh, okay, so you can see here that this is a uh, rule. Uh, and uh, is it worth going through this now? Uh, very briefly, yeah, very briefly. Okay, so uh, I don't, I don't want to go into the details of things like hooks. Uh, or do I? Sure, why not? Okay, so network filter tables, right? Within the uh, Linux kernel. Okay, so this is this is really low level stuff. All right, so within the Linux kernel, okay, there is uh, the network stack, and within that is this thing called net filters. Now, 
as a packet is processed, so a packet comes in, okay, so the packet of data comes into the system via a physical network interface card. Okay, now the job of that is to read the wire and to get the data and turn it into a piece of data which is then handled to the kernel for processing. Now that goes through a number of processes. Okay, so there's a there's a whole processing stack uh, where it goes through. Now at various points in that process, like for example routing and stuff like that. Okay, there are hooks. And these hooks are points for which you, uh, as the administrator, can attach um, processes. Okay, uh, so you can attach things to these hooks to say, right, uh, when you reach this hook, uh, pass the data to this. Now, one of those things that you can do with it is you can pass it to uh, some of these uh, network filter rules. Right? And that's what this is doing. This is saying that this chain, and I'll explain the chain in a minute, is a filter. It's hooked to the input uh, with a priority of zero. Forget about the priority for a minute. So there is a, there is a hook in here okay called input and that hook is attached such that anything which comes in hits this input hook and when it hits that input hook uh, that packet will be given and processed by this chain okay and this chain has a load of rules at the moment it has no rules it has a load of rules uh, which decide what happens to that packet okay so the packet comes in goes to the input chain okay for processing and then uh, either gets passed on for further processing or it gets dropped in which case it just gets ignored it gets rejected in which case something will be sent back or it gets accepted in which case it continues processing and only if it gets accepted all the way down the road okay will it go to the application itself okay so in other words uh, it gets popped out outside the kernel, into user space, and into the application, generally, right? Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about chains. A chain is just a named list of rules. That's it. Okay, so uh, a network filter, um, a chain is just a list of rules. And that's it. You don't need to think of it as anything else, right? Uh, well, actually, we'll call it a named list of rules, right? So, uh, in this setup here, we've got three chains: input, forward, and output. Right? So these chains are just lists of rules. The input list of rules is attached to the input hook which is part of that kernel process. The forward list of rules is attached to the forward hook which is again a different part in that kernel processing and the output list of rules is attached to the output hook. Now input and output should be fairly obvious right? Uh, any packet, any packet coming from the network interface card into the kernel will eventually hit the input hook and be processed by, because we've attached this chain, the input list of rules. Okay. Any packet coming from an application and going out okay, will eventually hit the output hook Okay, and the output hook will then invoke the output list of rules or chain. Okay, by virtue of being attached to this output hook. Uh, forward is a bit of an odd one. Okay, and forward is a special case. Forward is when uh, a packet arrives 
uh, and as part of Uh, uh, as part of the processing, it's decided, uh, for example, when routing, that the packet isn't appropriate to be sent to an application on this uh, on this machine, but instead needs to be sent to uh, another device, another machine. Okay, in which case. It will come in, it'll hit the input, because after all it was an input, uh, and it will go, instead of going out to an application, it goes to the forward table for further processing. So the forward, uh, sorry, not the forward table, the forward chain, okay, <coughs> or list of rules, where it will be processed further, okay, and only then will it hit the output, because it's going out again, okay? Assuming it makes it that far. Okay, so forward is a is a slightly special case. Now, just to make life difficult, okay, these chains uh, are further organized into tables. A table is just a collection of chains. That's all it that's all it is. Right? And there are various ways of specifying these, okay, so that they uh, they get run now. This is where it gets a bit mind bending. If I have two tables, uh, in this case, this one is, is an IP table and it's called filter. And that is, uh, it, it, this table has actually been set up because I ran IP tables. Okay. Uh, but I could create another table called filter two. Okay. So the table could be called filter two. And in there, I could put a chain called input. And I could set up a load of rules. Right. Now the question now is, and, and, and that input could be attached to the hook input. So the question now becomes, what's the point of the table? Tables are purely organizational. Okay, they just help you once you get complex sets of rules. They help you divide things up and, and actually make them into sensible size chunks. Uh, the input chain okay will be run irrespective of which table it's in and tables will simply be put together into a single list uh, so the uh, the input chain uh, these rules will be run filter table 2 the input chain would also be run but all of the rules will be run together so the important unit of organization is the chain okay because all all chains called or all chains attached to the input hook will be run when the input hook is is hit okay irrespective of what they're actually called so i could call it fred okay i could have called this chain fred okay chain fred could have been attached to the input hook now when the input hook is hit um, as, as the packet goes through okay it will go to whatever chain i've specified it's just a list of rules remember okay it's just a list of rules so uh, so if it was called fred it would still be here it doesn't matter what it's called by convention input forward and output are associated with the hooks input forward and output it makes life simple and similarly if i had multiple tables just for organization remember Okay, uh, I would call the chain attached to the input hook. I would still call it chain input. Okay, all of the rules would still be run when that input hook was hit. Okay, so go on then. Go. Where are you going? Yeah, I know it's dinner time. Oh, right, off you go. Oh, you're being a pain, aren't you? Oh, you bloody nuisance. You're bloody nuisance. Yes, you are. Right. Okay. It's dinner time. So I'm going to have to leave it. But we'll come back to this. We're starting to get to the interesting stuff now where we start to set up a, a firewall. 
Uh, so, what have we achieved today? Well, we've looked at uh, blocks of data coming into our network interface card, which we are, which we refer to as frames. Okay, we've learned about the layer model. Uh, we've learned about the fact that each frame contains bits of data for uh, uh, about each of the layers uh, which goes through. We've seen how the lower levels are concerned with the physical connection, the data link layer. And as you go up the model, those become more and more abstract. So first we're concerned about the actual physical things that are transferring the data between them. That's the data link layer. Then above that is the two nodes which are connected. That is the, the two machines that are talking to each other, irrespective of the physical connections between them. Yeah. Above that, you've got the transport layer, which deals with how the data is transferred between the two, how it's coordinated. And above that is the application layer, which, if you like, is the why. It's the actual stuff you want to transfer. Yeah. All the rest of it is just needed to get that application data from A to B. Uh, now, why did we look at that? Why did we look at those packets? Well, we looked at those packets so that we could understand two things. We could understand routing. Okay. Now, routing uh, is really about making a decision about where to send the packet next. It's really concerned with the physical connections. Okay. Uh, if. <laughs> uh, so it's it's talking about where to send it on the on the, the networks that this machine knows about. If this machine knows about two networks, it needs to make those decisions. If it knows about three, it needs to make that decision. Okay, so the routing makes the decision about where the packet goes next, whether it's coming from an application to go somewhere, or whether it's coming in and being sent out again. Okay, the routing comes into play. For our purposes, we were talking in our example about us just contacting Google to get it to send it its home page. Okay. We saw that the routing said, okay, go to the the gateway, which was on the virtual machine, uh, out to the virtual box gateway, which just connected us through onto the local area network. And then from there, out to the ISP, and from the ISP, through various machines until it eventually got to Google. Uh, so that's routing. So that's one thing we need to understand. But the other thing we need to understand is network filters. And network filters are rules that get applied as the packet goes through the kernel. Okay, and that can make other decisions. Okay, and can do other things to our packet. It can, for example, decide to ignore a packet. It can decide to reject a packet. It can decide to accept the packet and send it to an application. Uh, a network filter can also manipulate the packet. It can change things in the packet. Hey, once the packet's in our machine, we can do what the hell we like to it. It's just a piece of data. Okay, so we can fiddle with it, uh, and we can we can redirect it. We can send it elsewhere. We can forward it to a different machine. We can, uh, 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 yeah. I mean, we can modify it um, in various ways before we send it on uh, and that's what the network filters are for okay that's what the that's what the rules are for uh, now the list of rules are related to operations within the kernel by hooks okay so as the packet goes through the kernel processing it eventually reaches a point in the kernel processing where it triggers a hook when it triggers that hook operations are performed. One of those operations is to send it to a list of commands or a list of filters which determine filter rules which determine what happens to it according to uh, the network filters uh, interface. Uh, if it makes it all the way through that and it is accepted uh, then it will drop out and it will carry on processing by the kernel until eventually the kernel says, I'm done with this, and sends it onto the application. 
uh, you can trigger more than one hook as we go through the kernel and we'll, we'll talk about the hooks and where they sit in the kernel processing and this is all interlaced with the routing okay so uh, filters and routers, routing are intimately related uh, we discovered that we can we can organize uh, filter rules into chains and chains are just named list of filter rules okay and it's actually the chain which is associated with the hook okay and that's how we get certain lists of rules associated with certain parts of the kernel operation okay uh, we learned that we can organize chains into tables and tables are there for no other reason really than organizing uh, our chains just makes it easier on us poor humans to understand what the hell's going on but we understand that when a hook is hit any chain from any table as long as it's associated with that hook those rules will be executed right? Uh, and, uh, yeah okay so that's it that's where we are so far but that's quite a long way uh, we've, we've we've covered a lot so next time i think we'll actually start constructing a few rules uh, and start uh, messing about with our network uh, filters and start constructing some rules to capture packets and do interesting things right after which we will take that exercise and we will translate it back if you can remember back this far to salt uh, and salt has a way of manipulating the network filter tables so we'll then set up the salt rules which will set up our network filter tables uh, and we'll make sure that uh, our configuration conforms uh, to the way we want it to be set up in our final machine. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a good day today. Right, I'll see you in the next one.